Please welcome solvers. Jacob Johansson, CEO, Gleechi. Ram Don Yadav Katamaraja, founder and CEO of Colaberry Inc. Deanna McDonald, CEO, Block. And our moderator, Jennifer Strong. Hi again. So our next group here are solvers here to talk about their data in action. And I'm going to start down here with you, Jacob. So you're building and expanding software called Virtual Grasp, which automates the highly, highly complex process of creating movement for artificial hands, am I right? So mm -hmm. how are you using data to do this? Yeah, so I mean, first and foremost, we, we're kind of developing this software technology to make it easy to interact in the VR space. And we're mainly applying it for the purpose of developing virtual reality education and training, in particular for people who have challenges learning in the old kind of traditional ways of like reading long material. So we focus to, to, uh, to a large extent on people with uh, autism, people with dyslexia. But to kind of power this and make it possible to kind of scale this type of technology to make it somehow you know, easy to apply VR so it's not like a big investment every time. Uh, we have some kind of core technology to, to enable this. And that's technology actually coming from a completely different field. It's within uh, robotics technology to kind of tell a computer hand how to grasp and interact in, in, a, in a virtual space. And this is essentially a technology that's um, generally you know, based on the fact that you, you, you train a computer how to use a hand by looking at how humans use their hands. So we're, we're kind of training the computers to become more human so we can kind of make technology more you know, available and easy to use for, for humans. So yeah. So Deanna, you next. You work at the intersection, really, of digital infrastructure, tech, and also policy through the use of blockchain technology. What types of data are you using and how? We, um, we try to focus specifically on the data that we need, not necessarily on large amounts of data. Um, one great example is what we brought in to solve as well uh, last year, and what we're here for is um, our Fuel, marine fuel tracing um, application. So there are new environmental regulations coming down in um, for the first time in the shipping sector, which we have been largely ignoring as ter in terms of emissions in this world. We've had sulfur regulations in the transportation sector on roads, uh, but not in the shipping sector. So now that's happening. However, these regulations are global, as you could imagine, as shipping touches every single corner of the world, and not every environment, not every. Um, regulatory regime is equal and how do they enforce this. Uh, but secondly, there's just no data in the shipping sector either. So we have to start from scratch. Uh, we go in and we have to find the specific data associated with the fuel, the transfer of the fuel through the supply chain and all of the quality metrics associated. So the analysis of the fuel, does it meet the sulfur requirements? And new fuels, if we want to help to transition the maritime sector as well as to analyze all of those fuels and put them on. Um, and then decision support systems for, for fuel purchasers, but more importantly is also the enforcement and compliance of this. So how do we create monitoring, reporting, and verification systems? And verification being the key term here and why we're using blockchain. So how do we also verify that data? And we spend a lot of time on securing the inputs. How do we ensure that the data going into this system is actually the right data that we need? And how do we ensure that it's, if it is coming from a sensor, that sensor is secured. Uh, how do we ensure if it's coming from a human that they're not incentivized to put in the wrong data? And lastly, how do we ensure their privacy conditions in, are met, uh, as well as the ability to be able to transfer that data to different actors in the supply chain? Mm -hmm. Now, you, Ram, your solution is about retraining the workforce for careers in data science and analytics. Why data versus, say, coding right now, which is very hot? Uh, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, first reason is uh, the future that is driven by AI and powered by automation is uh, fundamentally uh, driven by data. So almost uh, according to recent reports by McKinsey, about 81% of the value of AI is driven by good data and advanced data analytics. So for the industry, data is the core skill. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we focus on adult learners. Uh, what we found out is a data-first learning is actually easier for adults to learn. 
Um, and typically, the adults we are focusing on uh, have some sort of uh, uh, skill already because they've been working in the industry, either as a frontline worker or a business analyst. Um, and when you empower them with data skills, right, they can transport their existing skills into the data industry. Uh, moreover, uh, working with data is like more like working with Legos, right? You can see it, you can feel it, uh, and as you play around with it, you can fall in love. So uh, when uh, you are trying to help an adult transition into the tech careers. When you start with data, it's an easier place to start, and coding becomes like a natural extension for them to learn. So these are the two reasons why we focus on data. Yeah, and to follow for you, but really for all three of you, how do you think data and human skills complement each other? Uh, we focus on uh, human skills a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so in the future of work, uh, uh, at work of the future, the fundamental two skills that are required is lifelong learning mm -hmm. uh, and then the human skills, right? So, and human skills is a very uh, dicey topic. Like, no, there is no uh, clear way to uh, define it. There's a lot of argument around it. So what we did is we created one metric which allows us to easily measure. Um, and, and that is an interview skill. So if somebody does an interview, for a job transition job, will they get that interview? So that is a good outcome data point. And uh, we created the uh, platform that allows us to do it at scale. So, uh, the, uh, so one, human skills are critical. And also what we saw is uh, these skills are learnable, at, uh, teachable at scale. Uh, and, uh, we, we, and we are proving that one third of our populations get their job in their first interview. Uh, that's what our data shows, and yeah. So, and we are making like good progress there. Either of you want to chime in? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, the way we look at it is, I mean, we're developing so software solutions both for the kind of VR space and robotic space, and in both areas, we're very much kind of goal oriented in the sense where can technology actually benefit humans? I mean, even though we are kind of training computers to be kind of humanoid with being able to grasp and interact, and I mean, we we do in cases with, for example, ABB, where we're kind of helping collaborative robots being able to pick up and behave more like humans. But it's kind of not the intention of replacing humans. It is, you know, about utilizing this data to be able to create robots, which I mean, the whole definition of robot is, you know, something that can, can you know, help us. It's a, it's a tool for, for, for helping us. So I think it's, it's about kind of finding where technology really can excel at doing some particular things. I don't think that robots or AI is going to take all our jobs because jobs are very complicated in general, but it might replace some tasks. And, and um, I think that's kind of a natural thing, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Deanna, do you have anything you want to add? I think maybe also just to add a, maybe another dimension to it, I think there are areas where it does complement for sure our skill sets where we're better able to use that for personalized learning, for adaptation and recog you know, recognition of, uh, or rebuilding our brain you know, circuits even. Um, but I think there's also a very big danger right now, especially in utilizing this, these data sets to define ourselves in marketplaces uh, or in, for example, the you know, phenomenon of, of the internet and the data points that we have also deterring from us getting jobs and, and providing different kind of profiles about us that aren't necessarily true to who we are. And just to kind of maybe wrap in on that point there, there's a lot more that's not explained by data emotional and cognizance um, and rationality that we have as humans that aren't necessarily something we can read off a spreadsheet. So I think they're complementary, uh, complementary, but I think there's probably a delineation we should also be very aware of as well. Sure. Uh, something else I want to ask you, I mean, marine transport is responsible for something like 90% of global trade. It's a very powerful, <laughs> powerful thing, but it's also pretty set in its ways. So what has it been like to be an innovator and also just kind of in that space trying to move that sector forward? Um, it's, uh, it's difficult, but I think one of the things, so we focus predominantly on collaboration and on building technology for the industry. They define the problems and we build consortiums around the supply chains that we're addressing. So we bring them to the table and by them I mean industry actors, policy makers, academics, technologists, 
and we negotiate between us what we want, the, what, what the problem is first, and whether or not blockchain is even a solution for it or even technology in general. And if it is, then how do we build that and learn from it together? How do we validate it and iterate on it? Um, and from there, if, that, if that's successful, we'll scale it. So in that respect, we bring the industry with us along that educational path. And I think that's a very important aspect in any industry. Um, and secondly, we do a lot of outreach, we do a lot of engagement, we do a lot of workshops, we do a lot of one-on-ones, and we take, a, we take our time to not define the technology for the technology's sake, mm -hmm. but instead we, um, we spend a lot of time working with, these are, you know, naval architects and engineers, they're pragmatic people, you know, what am I using this for? Am I a seafarer that has all my certificates in a big binder that if it falls off of a ship, I'm out of work for a year? Or you're talking about electronic certificates? Okay, that makes sense to me. Sure. So it's, it's always contextual, but it's um, especially in this sector where they're using Telefax, maybe WhatsApp if we're lucky, um, and wherein the, the ships have not changed since we started uh, shipping things around the world, and we're coming in and saying, hey, blockchain, and now we're integrating with synthetic DNA for the tagging of the fuels. Like, yeah. just trust us, blockchain, synthetic DNA, we're the kids of the future coming to, you know, it's, it's, it's a fine balance. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. Yeah. I say that, but I've been on a couple of container ships in the last year to look at things like smart contract. You know, exactly. So, okay, fair enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, this is a question for Jacob first, but really for all of you. I want you to kind of look ahead and think about from your own experience, where do you see opportunities for what you do and the tech you work with um, to really advance data for good going forward? Yeah, I mean, I can start off, I mean, we are quite focused on, on the VR space at the moment. I mean, of course, we are experimenting with everything from, you know, um, AR and, and robotics in those kind of contexts as well. I, I think both of those technology areas is a little bit further away, whereas in virtual reality, we kind of see that the technology is very much here and now we can actually do proper things today with it. I mean, it's affordable, it's accessible. The research really shows that VR can be used from everything, which we are focusing to a large extent on, on training, certification, helping you know, people that you know, need to learn any kind of new task, from be it mathematics or learning about history by actually traveling to Rome or learn, learning about new culture by, by visiting China. You know, it's, uh, so, so I think there's a lot of kind of potential in it and we've seen so many other aspects of, of, of um, kind of how this technology can be used for different purposes. I mean, we see now, I mean, some of the biggest challenges we have globally, I think, you know, you can see how virtual reality as one of many other tools can be used. It's not gonna be a solution in itself. It's gonna be kind of one tool to kind of mm -hmm. benefit all this. But I mean, we have a huge challenge in Europe at the moment with a lot of immigrants and we see a big counter reaction from like a lot of political parties that kind of want to close the borders. And I mean, what we see, for example, with VR is that you can use it as a fantastic empathy machine by experience how it is to be in someone else's shoes. We've seen that, you know, in VR, you can actually reduce kind of this implicit bias, you know, you can actually prove that people become less racist right. by just being in VR with another person's, you know, yeah. in another person's body. So I think there's some kind of fascinating things where this technology really can make a, a significant difference uh, for, for humanity as yeah. a whole. Uh, so yeah. For sure. Sure, uh, I'm excited about uh, the possibility of uh, uh, development of human skills at scale. Uh, basically, printing books allows to democratize knowledge where more people could adapt. Uh, similarly, human skills are learnable. So using technology and being, uh, finding innovative ways, uh, there is a opportunity to, uh, to develop human skills at scale. I mean, if we take us, for example, we just created one KPI, one job interview equal to one job. So it's a simple KPI. Similarly, uh, there are, there may, it's just related to our context. So uh, by simplifying how we look at the human skills, what are the outcomes that we are looking for? Uh, we can uh, repurpose and develop technology so that we can uh, develop human skills at scale. And also it's pretty context driven. Like when you're talking about <coughs> human skill, it's a context and it changes from context to context. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, uh, this human skill that is required by a, uh, analyst versus a developer versus a salesperson, they are all different. So if we can contextualize what human skills are and simplify the metrics, uh, we'd be able to develop them at scale. Sure. 
Deanna, same question for you. How do you see blockchain technology driving socioeconomic change? Um, I'm, I'm, I believe that blockchain is, is a piece of the puzzle and it's a pretty good one in terms of empowerment, not only on the local context as an individual or in my community and enabling communities to be empowered with their data, um, but I also see that it links and interconnects us globally as well, or it could. Um, it's a great tool for governance, which is really what we're talking about here, is inclusive participation in markets and economies and having, you know, um, the credibility to do so. I think it's a foundational technology there, but I would be remiss if I didn't say that really where I see it um, helping is, is our current ways of creating data and what we use data for, our entire technological development more or less has been about extracting data out of the system. It's about creating, we create that data and now it's traded on a behavioral future market that dictates what we do. But what happens when we create, when we capture the value within the system and when we focus on value creation amongst us? And I think that's one of the aspects that blockchain really will contribute to in the future if we do it right. Um, and if we design for a future wherein we can create value together and we share in that value directly between each other, uh, peer to peer, you know, individual to individual, business to business, rather than having these intermediaries that are, are predominantly extracting that data out and using yeah. it for themselves. And kind of to that end, I mean, Ram, 70% of your users are from underrepresented populations. In your view, what do you think can be done about the skills gap? Oh, to add to that, uh, about 45% are women, and mm -hmm. we actually impacted about uh, 120 at-risk youth uh, in the Bay Area by partnering with Year Up. Mm -hmm. So it has been an amazing journey. Um, uh, like, I mean, skills gap, especially in the work of the future, uh, it's uh, uh, w some of the observations that we made was uh, one of the biggest barriers is uh, the cost. So we introduced income share agreements. They work really well because it, we, uh, it's uh, incentivization from both sides. Mm -hmm. um, and then accessibility to technology. In my, in my view, accessibility is about if you want to work in these advanced uh, technologies, you need to have access to good computing power, right? Uh, and um, normal kid uh, in, a, uh, uh, in a troubled neighborhood, they would not have access to the good computer. Probably they have to go to a library or something. So we introduce a skill cloud uh, which allows us to provide co powerful computing to anybody so that they can learn by doing and become like really good and be ready for the future of work. So uh, by, by thinking about your constituent, like who you are serving and what are the barriers for them to get to, uh, into the new future of work, that allows, uh, that, that, that's the way to address the skill gap. Uh, that's, that's at the individual level for the organizations. Uh, I think uh, there should be a conversation about inclusivity in the policy. Mm -hmm. So right now there's a group thing. You always hire people uh, with uh, high performing or a similar demographic or uh, somebody who fits into your traditional mold, right? They have to open up especially if the demand side opens up to inclusivity and uh, they try to hire uh, uh, people, the supply side, the people are willing to learn the skills, right? If there is a job, they're willing to work for it. So that's, I think that's one way uh, from the organization standpoint to yeah. increase the inclusivity. Yeah. Now, quickly here, because we're standing between uh, cocktail hour uh, for these folks. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know from each of you, if you have thoughts on how people can take control of their own data and then leverage it in a positive way. All right, I'll go. Uh, so uh, we found uh, that data can be used in a very powerful way for uh, human development, right? Um, when people are going through the process, we present them the data before them, and they use the data to change their behavior. So for, uh, meaning uh, they would, like, I mean, just simple example. So they would uh, be competitive and allocate certain number of hours in a week. Mm -hmm. uh, to uh, to do the work to go the extra mile, uh, and other thing that we did is we created a success a, a path to success using data. Uh, we collected millions of data points from the people who graduated before, uh, and we create we basically show the roadmaps to the people who are going through it. So at any given point of time, they might be feeling down, but they can go and look at the data of the people who succeeded in the past. Mm -hmm. 
so that they know, okay, I have a shot, I, can, I, I still need to keep working. So that data could be used in a powerful way uh, for human development. And then uh, as uh, individuals, uh, if you learn uh, how to uh, how to understand data, how to navigate data, you can better your life. You can understand what better uh, career opportunities are there. So it's, it's just a powerful tool for the, uh, just uh, data can be used as a very powerful tool to change your life. Any closing thoughts, either from Deanna or Jacob? Not, not really. I, I, mean, we, I, I mean, it's one aspect of big data and kind of the profiling individuals, which is like obviously a huge problem with uh, the, the power that Facebook, Google has. I mean, the kind of data that we are collecting in terms of kind of how people are using their hands and how you're kind of grasping different objects is not necessarily useful in itself <laughs> for individuals. It is more how we apply it and that we can actually enable people to kind of use the data we've collected and improved kind of how you can interact naturally in a virtual space. So I mean, the whole purpose is essentially to help people, but, but the, the kind of data collection is, is kind of the purpose of it is very technical. It is kind of context. So. <laughs> 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 it doesn't have to be exactly that, but do you have any closing thoughts? I like your critical stance there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think we should be empowered to, to kind of own our own data, especially when it comes to our skills, when it comes to our motor functions, you know, not to have that data, for example, expropriated to identify us in CCC, CCTV, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that's exactly what I would use that for <laughs> if I flipped that. Um, so I think there's something to, to be said about protecting our own data, utilizing it and having our own ability to be able to use it when we want to and how we want to, or allow others to use it as we see fit by allowing them access. Uh, but I do not see that we have that alternative right now. And as it stands, you know, 98% of our apps on our phone are owned by Facebook and Google and pretty much all of the services offered to us that we can, you know, find value right now are offered. So I think until we have that alternative, I'm not entirely convinced that, that we have data for good or that we can build data for good until we know that the data rests on a foundation that we control and we are empowered to, to utilize. So I think it's not there. I don't know. But I hope that in the future, or I hope that we can build that alternative for data. Well, to that end, I asked the last group if uh, you know, we pull out the crystal ball and think about going forward, something they believe they will see or something they would like to see in terms of data for good. I'd, I'd, I would like to really see us uh, start to call it for what it is, start to name the unprecedented which is happening, um, just at the very least awareness about the topic of how our data is currently being used and how we are not involved in that conversation as it stands. So for my crystal ball, it would just be that we're having actual forums and discussions like this one and more that discuss how, how we want to go forward and how we want to, to build our future with data. Yeah. So. I would say uh, organi businesses need to open up uh, to hire based on data instead of resumes. Uh, one of the experiments that we did uh, where we helped a Fortune 500 company, the first hire they did was um, somebody who was rejected for three years. They were trying to get into the company. They, they were rejected, but once we presented the data, lights, the light bulb went on. So, in uh, expanding to data-driven hiring will allow to one extend the talent pool mm -hmm. significantly and that could change the game because uh, what we know uh, we are dealing with uh, data biases and artificial intelligence being uh, uh, the, uh, the learning of the data being done by very uh, cat, uh, small segment of the populations just opening up your uh, hiring pools, talent pools would be using data for good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> You're a total comedian backstage. Come on. Yeah. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> No, but I think, I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting topic and I think there's like a fundamental difference to kind of some of the aspects we're talking about here in the sense of like big data and how you can profile people and this aspect. And I mean, I'm not the kind of person who's kind of necessarily want to close in. I mean, as long as the data about me is somehow uh, private, I mean, I, I don't bother it kind of going away. But the problem for me is that it's being monopolized. I mean, that's, that's a big issue I see that, you know, some people have a lot of power over the data that's being produced. I mean, I would love to see some kind of solution where I can just click a button and say that every data point that 
Facebook or Google is collecting is also going to a completely open source kind of solution that's privatized and everyone can use it for any kind of good so we don't kind of monopolize it. I think that's, I mean, for me at least personally, uh, like the big issue and, and hopefully something like that could come at some point. Yeah. All right. Well, that'll do it for us. Thank you, everybody, for sticking with us. Thank you very much.